Halo Wars 2, uh, if you didn't know, uh, launched in early access yesterday, uh, which is pretty good. So you can imagine uh, just how much sleep I've had in the last 24 hours. So uh, you might want to bear with me. Uh, cool. Uh, so I'm Ollie Smith. I'm uh, the Blitz project lead uh, for Halo Wars 2. Uh, Blitz is a, a new mode, uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I've actually been at Creative Assembly uh, quite a while, so four years, uh, and I started out as the uh, producer on uh, Alien Isolation, which some of you might remember. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about Blitz. Uh, Blitz was something that was kind of a little bit different. It was a really exciting opportunity for us. Uh, it was a really uh, great uh, chance to work with Microsoft on adding something new to Halo. Uh, so I wanted to talk about uh, why it came about, uh, how we made it, and uh, how people responded uh, so far. Uh, but first, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour around uh, the studio, what Halo Wars 2 is, what Halo Wars 1 was, uh, and then what Blitz is before we dive into some of the more text-heavy bullet point slides, which are my favorite bits. Um, so Creative Assembly, uh, it's been around a while. It's been around almost as long as me, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's a really big studio, one of the biggest in the country. It might be the biggest, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, we've got some pretty good stuff. The Halo Wars 2 team just got a new building down the road in uh, sunny Horsham, which is a kind of Royston Vasey uh, in the south of England. Um, our pillars are big uh, on creativity and quality, uh, and we've got a, a really strong heritage of making uh, some fantastic strategy games uh, and some really good uh, console uh, games with things like uh, Alien Isolation. Uh, so it kind of made sense that when you want to bring Halo Wars back, uh, you might come to a Creative Assembly. Halo Wars, um, console RTS, one of the biggest, probably still the biggest selling uh, console strategy game uh, available. Uh, it was really well received back in 2009. It's got 82% Metacritic for people who like that. Um, really praised for its controls, bringing those uh, uh, mouse and keyboard, traditionally mouse and keyboard genre uh, to the console. Uh, and it was developed by Ensemble, who made uh, a little game called Age of Empires, which is pretty good. Uh, it was actually really intimidating when we were uh, approached about Halo Wars 2 because they started going back and finding out who was playing the original game. Turns out loads of people were still, this was back in 2015, so what, seven years after launch. And that game had uh, not much in the way of kind of uh, live support and patches and things like that, but still a really healthy, uh, robust, competitive community going on. So we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, fans with a lot of expectations to please. Um, 343 uh, were really uh, having just taken over the reins from Bungie, or uh, having just done uh, Halo 4, uh, were really excited about expanding the Halo universe. That's one of their big things. Uh, bringing back Halo Wars has been one of their top asks uh, for a while. Their other top ask is make another Halo game. Uh, and they've just been looking for the, uh, the right partner. Uh, and that was us. What was also great about this time was uh, they were just starting their big Windows 10 push uh, in terms of games. And so it was fantastic not only to bring Halo Wars back, but to bring Halo strategy games kind of back to their uh, native platform of the PC. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, that also involved remastering the original game uh, and getting that on the Windows Store as well. So I'm just about to show you the uh, launch trailer for Halo Wars 2, and I'll tell you a bit about Blitz. and play four days early. Yeah. Uh, it's bloody awesome getting blur cutscenes, isn't it? They are just uh, absolutely the best. Uh, so what is uh, Halo Wars 2? Um, it was quite interesting because uh, RTS has been away from uh, consoles for quite a while. Uh, and even back then, this was kind of pre-Deserts of Karak and Grey Goo and things like that. So on our PC, uh, things were a little bare. So uh, what we wanted to do was kind of uh, not just uh, discover the existing audience for RTS players, uh, but see if we could uh, introduce the genre to a new set of people. So our main thing was we were making the uh, RTS for everyone. Uh, that wasn't necessarily about just catering to new people. It was about catering to uh, literally everybody. We wanted to bring back the Halo fans uh, who enjoyed the universe, 
enjoyed the first game. We got some returning characters. Uh, we had some fantastic opportunities to bring uh, a new faction uh, to the universe with the Banished, which are kind of like the Covenant, but a bit more heavy metal, a bit more badass. Um, and it was actually well, a real pleasure to be uh, able to contribute to the universe. I think we were really surprised at how much creative freedom we had to uh, introduce new units and characters and things like that. Um, in terms of uh, multiplayer, we kind of were bringing back the classic stuff, uh, the kind of complex base building uh, affair. Uh, we maybe even added a few more systems to give that depth. Uh, we added these different leaders and things, really fleshed that out, uh, really interesting. And then Blitz. Uh, Blitz was kind of a thing that turned up uh, halfway through development, uh, which was about uh, addressing that people who uh, were maybe a little bit scared of real-time strategy because it's not the most uh, accessible uh, genre, uh, let me tell you. Um, so uh, I'm just going to show you a trailer that we had for Blitz. I start with the trailers, get you all hyped up, um, which is uh, for a beta that we ran uh, last month. Uh, ran for 10 days, uh, went very well. I'll talk about that in a bit. I don't know if anybody uh, had the chance to check that out when we ran it, but um, uh, that was pretty good fun. Uh, Ponying noobs uh, in that for a week, that was very good. So uh, what is Blitz? Uh, it's a fast-paced arcade experience. Uh, arcade, uh, mostly because uh, we wanted something a bit more light-hearted, something a bit quicker, something a bit faster. Um, in Blitz, what you do is you uh, build an army out of units uh, and the powers uh, that are available elsewhere in Halo Wars, uh, but this time they're manifested as cards. So you're essentially crafting a deck uh, and you're bringing that deck into battle and deploying them uh, into the action. What's fantastic about cards and cards you might have noticed are a little bit popular in games at the moment um, is it feels like uh, they're a really good uh, stepping stone or entry point for new players who might not understand uh, the nuances of a new type of game, but they understand the terminology of cards, a deck of cards, a hand of cards. Playing a card is uh, a really nice way to, to frame and explain uh, these kind of mechanics. Um, we wanted to uh, get rid of base building. I'll talk about why uh, we did that, because we wanted to bring the match times down. Uh, when we were talking about what, uh, what players wanted from a Halo RTS was uh, getting their kind of Halo action figures out and smashing them together. Time to tanks uh, was like a weird internal metric we had about uh, how quickly you could get to the action. And uh, Blitz is about getting that down to basically zero. Um, so yes, it was about getting uh, new players into the genre. But at the same time, we wanted to make a competitive multiplayer mode uh, that was still kind of deep and robust. Uh, it just wasn't uh, too deep and complex on the surface. Uh, but when you get down to that depth, uh, you find it really easily. So uh, this is, uh, but this is kind of back in the day, back before we had cards, back before we had any of this kind of stuff. We started looking at how uh, we were going to uh, bring new players into RTS. That was one of our big things. We did a ton of user research. We went out. We went all over Europe, speaking to uh, esports players, uh, hardcore strategy gamers, Halo fans, uh, and people who. Uh, weren't used to RTS or hadn't tried RTS, or maybe they tried RTS and they'd bounced off it. Uh, so what we wanted to do was find those issues, what had stopped people getting involved in RTS. We, as uh, an RTS studio, uh, freaking love RTS games, and so uh, it seemed weird to us uh, that people might not. Uh, so we wanted to find something that basically addressed every single one of their bullet points. Here are those bullet points. Um, one of the things that they uh, talked about was too much plate spinning. Uh, you had to deal with managing your army, making sure they were uh, taking out the enemy and not dying themselves. But you also had to go back to your base and upgrade it. And you also had to choose what technology you were going to build. And you also had to make sure you were getting enough energy to pay for all of this stuff in the first place. And this kind of creates a learning cliff. To succeed at uh, the game, uh, you kind of have to master all of those points at the same time. Uh, it's not enough to, to just focus on one area and then uh, uh, bring the other bits in later. 
One of the other things is, and this is true of things like MOBAs as well, uh, is match times are really long. Uh, and that means that if you're trying to learn and practice and get better, uh, you don't actually have that many goes at a game to, uh, to improve. It takes a very long time to do that. Um, it also kind of increases uh, toxicity was one of the big things uh, we found. You know, when you're playing really long match times and you only get to play one match of, uh, of a game a night, people get kind of pissed off if your teammate is, uh, is letting you down. Uh, and then the, the slow starts. While if you play uh, RTS games and you understand how important it is looking at scouting and build cues and stuff like that, um, if you uh, are watching something and you don't really understand how valuable that is, that kind of uh, slow burn ramp uh, often kind of doesn't make much sense and isn't that appealing. So we decided to uh, take those bullet points and address those. And the first thing we did was focus just on the unit combat. That was the most exciting thing. That was where all the iconic Halo units were. Uh, that felt really uh, important starting point. Um, and so our first prototype got rid of base building, got a ri rid of resource management, and it just had uh, armies versus armies. Essentially, you played it like Warhammer, the tabletop game. You had a, uh, all these units, and they all had a points cost. You had 200 points to spend or 1,000 points to spend, I can't remember. Uh, and you basically came in with these two big armies, and you smashed them together. That wasn't as fun as we thought. Um, you only had one combat front because you just kind of met in the middle and blew each other up. Uh, and so really what you wanted was all the tanks that survived the longest and dealt the most damage. So things like fast moving scout units, why would you send those in first? They're just gonna die. You want everything to arrive in the same big ball of death because that's the highest chance of winning. Diminishing returns, you had your kind of fantastic epic battle at the beginning and then you just had kind of 10 minutes of chasing this last warthog around the map uh, trying to finish him off and, uh, and win the game. Uh, which was funny uh, for some of our videos, but uh, uh, not super fun. Uh, and then these predetermined outcomes. Um, Halo Wars uh, is uh, got this kind of rock, paper, scissors counter system where uh, air beats vehicles, vehicles beat infantry, and infantry are really good against air. Um, and those kind of hard counters mean that uh, if you turn up with your carefully selected army and your opponent happens to have carefully selected the absolutely perfect counter to that army, there is literally nothing you can do. Those matches are over before you begin. So uh, what we actually did was we were like, we kind of want to double down on this. And we got a small team together to uh, basically do a, a keep or kill experiment. Is, is it possible to take the RTS ingredients that we have, remove the base building, and still keep something that's, that's fun and exciting? So you're gonna see some pretty ugly assets coming up now. So, so bear in mind that this was like 18 months, two years before launch. This is pre-pre-alpha kind of stuff. Oh. Um, so we started from our units versus units prototype, and we added a control zone. No more chasing the, uh, the warthog around the map. Uh, you just need to hold your central point. Uh, that warthog can, can go and do whatever he likes. Uh, an easy way to, to end things. Doesn't mean that uh, uh, you have more than one combat front, though, which was, which was still a problem. So uh, we added healing areas. You didn't just have to keep throwing your forces in. You could go back. Uh, and replenish. There would be a bit more ebb and flow. It also created supply lines that you could harass. Uh, so it gave uh, artillery or snipers, things like that, a really good uh, excuse to uh, still be chosen inside your army. Uh, beacon buffs, I'll explain those in a minute, but uh, they were basically creep camps that you cleared and they would give you a kind of upgrade thing you could then carry into the army. Um, the idea was that you'd send a fast scout unit, pick up that buff, uh, drive it up to the front lines and it would improve the, uh, the odds of your troops. Uh, again, giving uh, another point of contestion, uh, but also uh, an opportunity for scout units as well. And then reinforcement phases. You no longer just built one army, you built an army and a set of reinforcements. This was so that if your opponent had the perfect counter to you, you could bring in a reinforcement that would hopefully turn the tide. Still didn't really help because the other guy could then bring in reinforcements that were the perfect counter to that. So uh, it wasn't super um, great. We actually, one thing we do a lot at Creative Assembly and I think uh, is really uh, one of the really great things about working there is we do these big weekly team presentations uh, and we'll take these little groups that are, that are oriented around uh, features and they will kind of get up in front of the team uh, and show people what they've got. What I've got is one of those internal uh, videos uh, it's 
very work in progress. We haven't toned down the VFX that much uh, in this stuff. So uh, you're about to see some very ugly early prototypes of uh, basically what there, the, there was four of us, I think, uh, had done in about two weeks just to go, is this worth pursuing or not? <laughs> and some chill out guitar from uh, Halo 2 remastered. So these were the, uh, the creep camps that you'd clear. Look at those VFX, oh my god. Um, when you, uh, when you got rid of those, they would drop supplies. Uh, supplies were what you paid to bring in your reinforcements. That's not an official Halo prop. And then this is the beacon buff. So we're using kind of placeholder fire and things to show when units were affected or not affected by those buffs. This is a central control zone, pretty much speaks for itself. This was just an example of how uh, how much improved it was that the Vulture with its buff could, uh, could then clear uh, a room full of tanks. And then this is the anti-air guys who uh, take a little bit longer to take out those air units because they've been defended by a defense buff. What's interesting about this is that I go through the presentation, you're going to see that this turns into the start of a lot of mechanics that ended up in the in the final game, maybe not quite looking like this, but uh, you'll, you'll see the start of a lot of crazy ideas that we had. This was the reinforcement landing zone, so you didn't just contest the uh, central point, you also wanted to stop people bringing in their reinforcements, you also wanted to contest their creep camp, so some of our early artillery. I think we'd only just uh, created that unit, so that was a really interesting uh, uh, one to try out there. Every video at the team meetings always ended with this, uh, this vulture firing his giant missile because we just love that explosion so much. And you see a lovely stunt. There you go. Cool. Um, so we thought we were onto something. Um, and uh, cards started to uh, rear their head uh, in our thoughts, um, mostly because when we were talking about picking that army, even using the points cost, we were using this kind of deck building analogy. Um, we always thought that we'd change it to something more sci-fi and more Halo, but the, the terminology was really interesting and uh, it kind of stuck. Every time we tried to name it something else, people would just go, yeah, but it's my deck and I'm just picking this card. Uh, so we decided to... Um, we decided to embrace that and we embraced that in terms of building the deck, but then we went, well, if cards work for building the deck, maybe they can work inside the game as well. So the idea was that uh, once you'd build that army, you then took it into the battle and you'd have this hand of cards uh, and you'd play that straight into the action. And what was fantastic about that is it gave us this uh, uh, call and response uh, kind of gameplay where you'd find uh, someone would deploy a unit, you'd pick the counter to that, they'd find the counter to that, and, and you actually got back to a bit of that, uh, that strategy that we'd maybe lost a bit before. Uh, we still had points costs in a way. Uh, we didn't like the way we'd done points costs before because you wanted your tanks, and if you wanted an army full of tanks, then it was a really small army, and that didn't feel that good. You kind of want the, the, the Zerg rush or the, or the defensive army to be kind of equivalent size. So the better your units, the smaller your army. It wasn't very satisfying. Uh, with decks, uh, we let people build uh, armies of the same size, uh, but they cost more to bring them out. So uh, you had a bit of a risk reward there, because if the guy then uh, had his perfect anti-tank unit just sitting in his hand ready, uh, then that was a bit of a waste of money. One other thing that we did, and it was quite interesting when we did the beta, uh, the people didn't know whether it was a bug or not, but we got rid of um, fog of war in the traditional sense. Uh, one thing that we found was uh, <laughs> because you were bringing units uh, into the match, you couldn't, there was nothing to scout. You couldn't go and look at someone's base and go, what are they building next? What's their build key? What's their plan? Um, and uh, you basically ended up kind of these guys materializing out the fog of war, and then you'd be scrambling to get the thing that you needed. And actually what you wanted was, was not to just keep spamming units into the battle. You wanted to be able to kind of see what was coming and prepare and, and respond appropriately. Uh, so we have fog of war in Blitz, mostly to show you where you can play cards, because you can play cards wherever you have line of sight. <laughs> So then we started uh, refining it. We'd grown the, uh, the Blitz team quite a bit by this point, um, and we started uh, uh, 
we started looking at the deck building. Originally, our deck building is very traditional. It's very much like Magic or Hearthstone. You had 30 cards or 20 cards, I can't remember. Um, and you could get duplicates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it had some, it kind of worked, but it had some problems uh, in terms of we didn't really know what to do when you ran out of cards. That, that <laughs> do you end the game? Well, if you end the game, then they'll just hold on to the last card and, and not play that. And um, also, uh, it was very fiddly, especially when you're looking at uh, uh, gamepad controls and stuff like that. Uh, it was very difficult to, uh, to build your deck. Uh, and also, it didn't look very good, because to s have 30 cards fit on a screen uh, was very difficult. We wanted something you could screenshot and go, look, this is my favorite deck. This is what I, what I think is going to work uh, today. Uh, so we reduced the size of the deck. This was around the time uh, there were a few mobile games coming out. Uh, that had uh, lots of kind of similar deck building mechanics. Um, and it was really interesting how they had solved that problem with, this, uh, with, the, with the card cycling. Um, when you played a card, it didn't just go uh, away forever. It went to the bottom of your deck and it came back. And it added this, uh, uh, well, one, it encouraged players to play cards more frequently because they knew it would come back. You'd end up with people kind of sitting on these uber units and never playing them because they were like, maybe there'll be a better time later on. But now you can play it and go, well, it's okay, it'll come back. So I, I don't need to worry too much about that. It also actually gave us a um, skill differentiator because uh, you now had new players who were going, what's the best card uh, in my hand that I can play to deal with the situation? Uh, but now, because they know that the cards are coming back in the order that they played them before, they're going, what's the best card in my hand? But also, what card might be coming up uh, in the next two or three draws? Uh, can I remember that? And so it actually gave a way for uh, more veteran players to um, express themselves and, and outwit uh, newer players. Um, so once we thought we were embracing cards, uh, it was really important for us to, um, to do it right. Um, whenever we have a a big feature, we have pillars for uh, a game as a whole, but every time we have a, a, a big feature uh, in one of our titles, we make kind of mini pillars for those. Um, and one of our big uh, pillars for this was uh, cards are the most valuable object in the game. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, when you got new cards, it felt good and exciting and valuable. When, we, when you open a card pack in Blitz, uh, you've got these lovely kind of chunky metal uh, sounds and things like that. Um, when you're building a deck, a single card inside a 12-card deck uh, is a big commitment. It takes up a lot of space. That's a, that's a big chunk of your army. Um, and uh, what we wanted was that uh, the, the best way to change the outcome of a battle, uh, rather than necessarily the, the crazy micro gameplay, we wanted to lift that up in Blitz uh, to the card hand, where playing a new card um, would be the most uh, effective way of, of changing what was about to happen. Um, so we, uh, we spent a lot of time on this, and we actually ended up with two very different solutions for uh, the player input stuff. Uh, obviously, we, were, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, a game that was fun and satisfying with both a gamepad and a mouse and keyboard. Obviously, uh, quite a big challenge. Um, and we came up with two kind of separate solutions. You might not notice that much when, uh, when you play the game because they look quite similar, but... Um, for the Xbox and on the gamepad, uh, where radial menus are very popular, a uh, very intuitive way of selecting stuff, we fanned the cards. They look uh, uh, w very intuitive. It feels like, uh, feels like you're actually holding a fan of cards, and you select like that. Um, but on the PC, we actually went back to MMOs and MOBAs and went, actually, maybe this is more of a skill bar thing. We don't, we're not going to do a fan. PC players don't care about uh, radial stuff like that. Uh, let's, uh, let's see if we can make uh, essentially something that's more revolved around hotkeys. Um, so this is just a quick video showing you that stuff in action uh, so I can have a drink of water. We talked a lot about uh, whether when you played a card the unit would appear right there or whether it would come from a base or something like that where we really wanted that connection with you placing the card uh, on the ground uh, and then it appearing immediately. We've got kind of different teleport effects depending on the rarity and effectiveness of the card. So uh, your enemy can, uh, can uh, gauge its power just from how exciting it is when it comes in. There's actually four or five different ways of playing a card in, uh, on the PC. Uh, you can click the card and then click the ground. That's quite uh, straightforward. But also uh, tapping the, uh, the hotkeys 
uh, will um, deploy that card directly where, uh, wherever your cursor is. So actually it's very effective to build kind of front lines and back lines in terms of that stuff. Uh, we have a mechanic called summoning sickness uh, or deployment fatigue it's now called um, that basically when you bring a unit in it starts at uh, lower health. Uh, and what was important about that was we wanted to stop players uh, spamming units into battle. We wanted players to have a bit more uh, thought about this so that they would deploy them uh, further away from the action uh, and bring them in. Uh, what that meant was uh, your opponent had more time to respond. Please be aware, abandoned ship will be on the developer stage at 11 o'clock. That's okay, I'll be done by then. It's fine. Stage. Cool, so keywords. Um, Going back to our cards being the most valuable object in the game and playing a single card should change the outcome of a battle. And in RTS, where there are crap tons of units on the screen all the time, uh, sometimes playing a single unit w isn't going to make that big a difference. Um, so what we wanted to do was essentially make kind of uber units that, that could still change the tide even towards the end of battle. Um, uh, the key words that we've got here, we were kind of looking at existing uh, card games and going, well, how would that manifest in a, in a real-time strategy? There's obviously some obvious things. This one is uh, fear. It gives you a debuff aura to anything around it. Um, these guys up here have reflect with a classic kind of Spartan bubble shield, so uh, damage dealt to it is, uh, is bounced back. Uh, you can use those together quite nicely um, to increase the, the, the damage, so actually you might end up dealing more damage to, uh, to your opponent than you take. Guard was interesting. Guard was us looking at games like uh, Hearthstone and going, how does Taunt uh, manifest uh, in a real-time strategy game? Um, it, when you've got a unit with Guard, what it does is anything inside of its aura that takes damage, the damage is redirected to, uh, to the host unit. Uh, so it basically takes the bullet uh, for everyone, uh, everyone around it. It's a really good counter to explosions and bombing runs and things because you can do huge AOE damage, but only one unit will die. <laughs> Uh, basically, they were the evolution of the beacon buff. We really liked the beacon buff, this kind of aura thing, um, but we didn't like that you had to go out and get it. Blitz being more about the cards than the, than the unit control afterwards, um, we decided to turn them into essentially passive uh, mechanics. Uh, the other cool thing was, not only did it expand our card pool, uh, which is always really nice, um, but it meant that uh, players could bring in uh, multiple copies of particular units. One of the advantages of when our decks were 20, 30 cards uh, was that uh, you could kind of play the probability management game. There's a level of skill there in terms of going, OK, I want to increase the odds of me getting my anti-air units, which you kind of lose when you have your 12-card deck. So being able to take uh, a version of a unit and a variant of it restored that for people who are interested in manipulating those kind of probabilities. Oh, I just talked about that. The other thing was um, we wanted to make sure we had that depth of strategy. So you can kind of see that we were constantly kind of uh, swinging between making something uh, really approachable and accessible, um, but then uh, making sure that it had the kind of legs to, uh, to go in the long run. Um, Halo is actually a fantastic uh, series for this because it's filled with characters uh, who have really strong personalities. And Halo Wars 2 um, kind of introduces a whole bunch more of those. Um, in the traditional multiplayer modes, you still pick a leader, and that leader um, affects uh, some of your uh, build options, uh, some of your leader powers, and things like that. There's still a w th it's more of a guide, though, in the main multiplayer. You can still kind of play against that or play up to that. Um, in Blitz, um, we exaggerate that because we make these leader-specific cards, and a leader-specific card is quite a large chunk of your deck. Um, so you kind of have these very clear, very specific roles that you have to kind of embrace depending on the leader that you choose. Um, when you're playing 1v1, that's quite a lot of hassle. You've got to make sure that you've got a well-rounded deck that can deal with whatever your opponent can, uh, can throw at you. Um, but when you're playing in a team, what's fantastic is you can really embrace those roles and really become a, a, a specialist because you can use your teammate to uh, fill in the blanks, so to speak. Um, what's fantastic about that is you could go... Uh, uh, I could have a really fast, uh, light deck filled with cheap units. I get out early and I harvest uh, the energy that's on the map that the currency players use to bring out cards. And my opponent doesn't have to worry about that because we share energy. Uh, my deck is entirely about supporting my, uh, my teammate. Uh, my teammate can bring out heavy, expensive units and just concentrate on holding points. I'll take, some, I'll take some healing powers and keep those guys alive, but he doesn't have to worry about that. I've got his back. Uh, and we were really... Um, 
And we're really conscious of making sure that players kind of naturally work together in Blitz. We start uh, team games with everyone starting on the same location. So that even if you're not talking on a headset, you can go, right, he's going left, I'll go right. We, we let you bring in cards where your ally has line of sight. Uh, so you can always help reinforce a point that your partners may be struggling with. Um, and also, uh, what this kind of ends up with is any card in the game can be combined with any other card. And that's, um, that's kind of scary, uh, because obviously there's so many permutations. Uh, it's kind of exciting as well, and it feels very Halo. Halo, uh, the main series, is filled with kind of emergent physics and things like that. And uh, it was nice to kind of see players discover that. Uh, what I've actually got here is a video uh, that uh, someone in the community made. Lucky Lord, feel free to like and subscribe him. Um, who uh, compiled a bunch of kind of top plays from the beta. Um, I've kept the sound low so I can talk, uh, talk a little bit about it. So in Blitz, you've got these three capture points and holding the most capture points uh, wins you the game. This guy has a bit of a mind over might where he has a, a single unit that he's stacked super fast speed buffs onto so he can uh, get behind enemy lines and keep capturing the units away from the, from the, slow, uh, the slowness of the battle. Of the, uh, sorry, of the enemy's army. This is interesting because it sets the scene for a, a combination later on uh, where the guy sees uh, his teammate is about to be attacked. Uh, so rather than his teammate taking the hit, he teleports the enemy army over to him uh, so he can uh, uh, smash him up. Which one's this one? This one is a really interesting one. You kind of have to, uh, to stop to look at it. Vortex is a very popular power because it clusters enemy units together, you'll see that. Uh, and then they tend to just kind of throw some explosive thing in it, uh, as you'll see there. Um, what's interesting is the guy who was the victim of the Vortex actually tried to cloak because uh, cloaked units can't be attacked. So oftentimes you use Vortex to pin players in place uh, so that you can uh, attack them. Ca cloaks are really good at counter to that where you can just go, well, uh, now you can't attack me. Uh, this is my favorite. So there's a uh, unit that explodes on death here, the Suicide Grunt. And uh, the guys try to move away, uh, but uh, the player teleports them back onto the, uh, the AOE at the last point. This is when just some guy just got everything in, so I, I don't even know what's going on here. But it's pretty cool. I mean, in that, that was an example of them uh, harvesting a lot of energy, and uh, even when they're up against uh, overwhelming odds, being able to bring in uh, all these different uh, powers and abilities uh, was a pretty effective uh, way of clearing. Uh, what's really interesting about Blitz is we tried to make sure, um, if you uh, do any of your own clips, send them there, um, was to try and make sure that uh, uh, there were lots of comeback mechanics. Uh, so it was very easy to kind of uh, flip the map uh, back and forth. Um, if you uh, hold the same number of uh, control points as your opponent, your scoring stops. Uh, so even if someone is at uh, 199 out of 200 points, you can still go back and win that map if you, uh, if you control all of the domination points. And I have literally had a game where I came back from 25 points to 199 and still won, which was uh, fun. And I wish I'd been able to record that and share that. Um, so Blitz Firefight, that was, uh, that was kind of interesting and kind of came about by accident. That's the thing that you can actually play on the show floor today. Um, what we wanted to do was go, okay, we were looking at all of these things that were scary about real-time strategy, and one of the last things that is super scary about real-time strategy is multiplayer. And so Blitz obviously doesn't really address that because it is a very multiplayer-focused mode. What we wanted to do was create something uh, that gave players an opportunity to try out cards, uh, try out different deck styles and combinations in a way that wasn't going to let their teammates down or affect their ranking and things like that. Um, so what we did was... Uh, we created this sandbox. We just wanted to throw enemies of different compositions at you. Go, OK, have I got enough anti-air in my deck? No, OK, I'll go switch that out, that kind of stuff. Um, and got a little bit carried away where we started adding kind of harder waves and things like that. Stuck a boss in, which was just like a bunch of Spartans. Uh, and then we were like, well, fuck it, let's just put co-op in. And uh, we ended up with a, a, a legit and very cool uh, horde mode, essentially. Um, firefight. And co-op in general is a, is a real big staple of the Halo series. Um, it gives you an opportunity to work with your friends. You get all that kind of deck synergy uh, going on, um, but in a less kind of competitive, less serious kind of way. And uh, it gives you a different kind of deck you want to build. We have a few changes to Firefight. Your energy doesn't regenerate over time. You have to go out and harvest that kind of stuff. The enemy waves are 
uh, extremely overwhelming in numbers, so you need to make sure that you are, uh, have got lots of kind of good wave clear and things like that. But even in those early stages, though, before it gets really hard, you have the opportunity to fulfill the kind of power fantasy that multiplayer often doesn't give you because it's so balanced uh, of just smashing a loads of dudes in the face. Um, so this is what uh, Firefight kind of plays like. This is a 90-second kind of summary of uh, what can go up to kind of an hour uh, if you're working together with your friends. Early on in Firefight, it's just about building up your army because you, there's only a finite amount of resources coming in. Uh, so you want to make sure, not whether you can clear these first waves, but whether you clear wave 10. You're not really thinking about uh, who the enemies are at the beginning. These support helicopters are really interesting because in our early Blitz uh, prototypes, we didn't actually have much in the way of uh, healing. Units had a very short lifespan, uh, but actually as uh, Blitz kind of evolved, support units became incredibly important. Go, go, go! I'm under attack from Blitz. Over. It sounds like they need the professionals. So as you can see, it starts to get a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and we have a lot of different varieties of waves there. They're sort of random. We kind of put the uh, the, cost, the themes of the wave, whether they're air or vehicle, uh, in a predefined order. So you can build it and go, right, we've got to make sure we're ready for wave 11 because wave 11 is the air and we haven't got any air out yet. Uh, but at the same time, we also throw in a few kind of, we don't know whether they'll be banished units or whether they'll be UNSC units. We throw in a few keywords and things like that. Um, so that you can't necessarily bombing run a incoming horde because maybe they've got that guard keyword. Yeah, these guys aren't going to last long. One of my favorite things about Blitz is uh, we added kill streaks and all of that kind of stuff. We wanted something, like I was saying, arcade, um, uh, really um, exciting, a bit more light-hearted, a little bit less uh, end of the world, kind of Smash Brothers kind of... Uh, uh, vibe to it. And one of the things I always loved about Halo back in the day was um, uh, Jeff Steitzer's uh, overkill and all that kind of stuff. And so it was fantastic to go to uh, 343 and go, you know what would really make this mode? Kill streaks. And they were like, okay, we'll get Jeff Steitzer in on Thursday. And it was like, oh, that was fantastic. So um, uh, I was really happy about that. That was really, um, really exciting and a real bit of a fanboy moment for me. Um, so Blitz uh, obviously is a mode within Halo Wars 2. And um, uh, whilst we made a lot of changes with the cards and things like that, uh, it still very, very much uh, supports the main game experience. Um, your uh, knowledge of kind of how units work together and different strategies and tactics will, will carry over. Maybe not your, your economy management or your base upgrades, uh, but the roles of units are still very much applicable. If you understand that type of real-time strategy, then your skills are definitely going to transfer across. Um, what we do is actually when you play the campaign, at the end of every mission, we'll give you a pack that's themed around the units that have been introduced in that mission, uh, which has been a really good way of kind of letting players fill out their collection really early and um, uh, have a good, well-rounded kind of uh, experience when they're going to Blitz because they'll have learned how to apply those units on the battlefield. Uh, we've got a challenge system where uh, playing matches or playing as different leaders will give you card packs. Uh, and then over time, we're introducing new leaders who will also come with kind of uh, some completely different stuff. Uh, we've just got uh, Forge. If you uh, get Halo, uh, Halo Wars um, within the first couple of weeks, then uh, you can download Forge as a new leader for uh, free. You might remember Forge uh, as a character from the first Halo Wars, which is pretty cool. So uh, Blitz was quite an interesting thing. We kind of developed it in secret with a small team uh, for a while. Um, so it was quite scary to take it to the press. Um, but we did that in uh, uh, October uh, of last year. We did a lot of hands-on. Uh, we had some journalists. We had some eSports players. Uh, we had some YouTubers. Um, and what we found was we kind of expected, you know, the people, people like Forbes and stuff who were maybe not uh, crazy RTS fans uh, to enjoy Blitz because it was a bit quicker and a bit easier to understand. Uh, but what was actually really interesting was we found a new type of player, which is the catchily named time-constrained competitive gamer. Um, and what, uh, what those players are are people who loved StarCraft, maybe loved Dota and things like that. Uh, but they just didn't have time anymore. And uh, what was fantastic is Blitz scratched that itch of having strategy and synergy and things like that, but you could play it in a lunchtime. 
Um, it was also uh, really interesting to see those pros go uh, use this as the gateway drug and go, hey, I've never got my friend to play StarCraft, but I get them to play Blitz, and then maybe they'll play StarCraft after that, which was pretty cool. Um, so I think we, uh, I think we certainly uh, feel confident that we've, we were achieving our goal to kind of uh, be an onboarding experience while at the same time uh, letting players stay with Blitz and still find something exciting and interesting. Uh, my favorite quote is, the relentlessly zany blitz mode, which feels very 90s. Uh, so in January, uh, we released an open beta, and that basically takes us up uh, to the present day. And uh, the beta was uh, fantastic for us. Uh, we did uh, a couple of betas for Halo Wars, and we do a kind of few uh, internal ones as well. It's really, um, really useful for us. We have a lot of metrics and things like that. Um, we had uh, hundreds of thousands of players, and we had literally millions of games, uh, which is kind of fantastic and, uh, and quite intimidating. Um, and it was great to see those kind of guides and videos and deck building strategies and stuff like that uh, uh, coming on. Uh, we had some kind of really interesting uh, balance uh, debates and things where we'd go, oh, okay, this looks overpowered, but is that because people haven't learned how to use the counter to that and, and, and things like that? There was a lot of discussion about cloak early on, uh, but then you kind of just watch the meta shift over kind of three days where suddenly all detect units that reveal cloak units suddenly become a, uh, a must-have in your deck. So it's really been interesting watching that, and, and certainly after launch, we're going to continue uh, taking a look uh, and getting that kind of feedback. So, uh, and that basically takes us up to the present day, where uh, Halo Wars is uh, now out, if you uh, buy the Ultimate Edition, or uh, out on the 21st, which I think is Monday? Is that Monday? Yeah, Tuesday. Um, uh, if you want the, uh, the Standard Edition. Uh, so I hope you uh, take some time to check it out. Uh, and uh, I believe you can play Blitz Firefight on the show floor, uh, so have a go there. Uh, try the old double tap to play cards. People. Uh, People don't find that early on. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions, uh, I think I've got some time. That'd be cool. Thank you.